I'm Jack Hemingway. Welcome to Incredible Idaho. Well, we're on the road again, this time along the banks of the Boise River, close to the capital city. You know, areas like this along the river bank flourish with plant life. Willows, cottonwoods, shrubs hug the banks and actually draw their sustenance from the river itself. Riverbanks like this, known as riparian zones, are classified as wetlands, very important ones in the arid west. But whether they're bogs or marshes or swamps, they all have one thing in common, an abundance of wildlife. We're just beginning to become aware of the value of our wetlands. For years, with the government's blessing, America has systematically eliminated a precious resource until less than half of the country's original wetlands remain. In the past, people did use wetlands as places to dump their old refrigerator and their toilets and to fill, and they were considered wasteland. But I think today, people are really changing, and they realize after we've lost 50% of our wetlands that these areas are important for a lot of functions and they're beautiful places to go wandering in and, and to see a lot of different birds and animals. The federal government has caught up with the trend, instituting a no net loss wetland policy that evolved as a result of a campaign promise in the 1988 election run. But despite the federal policy, we're still experiencing wetland loss in the United States at the rate of an acre a minute. In Idaho, of the estimated 95,140 acres that remain, about 380 are lost each year. You don't see huge wetland losses occurring today in as far as 1,000 acres like you did back in the 50s, 70s. But the losses we have today are incremental bits and pieces. Marshes such as Gray's Lake National Wildlife Refuge, Harriman State Park, Centennial Marsh, and the Kootenai National Wildlife Refuge are the traditional image of a wetland. But the most vulnerable are the less obvious ones. The places where most of the losses occur are the thin green lines that wind through the high deserts of Idaho. This particular riparian zone along Cottonwood Creek here in Boise is fairly typical of a lot of the Intermountain West. It's a narrow strip of uh, relatively lush vegetation surrounded by an arid upland. There are three components to every wetland. The main element, of course, is water. This drives the other two, hydric soils and the water-loving plants that flourish in this earth. These thin green lines are the lifeblood of Idaho's desert wildlife. Just because they're small does not mean they're not important. The detritus from the vegetation breaking down starts the food chain, then there's a layer of insects, and then there's a layer of birds and fish, and and it just moves right up the food chain. It's very important. In the winter, these areas also provide protection or cover for prairie birds, such as sharp-tailed grouse. There's a whole host of, of wildlife species, including a lot of the wading birds and uh, um, ducks that just wouldn't uh, be in this part of the world if there wasn't wetlands. Wetlands in Idaho are critical as summer breeding areas. Ducks, geese, and the world's largest nesting concentration of greater sandhill cranes build their nests among the bulrushes and cattails at Gray's Lake. If you go to one of those areas in eastern Idaho where you have those sandhill cranes and the beautiful, beautiful sound they make is it's just one of the most wonderful experiences that you can have. Wetlands also serve as important stopover points for migrating waterfowl. Each spring, Mud Lake in eastern Idaho becomes a temporary oasis for thousands of snow geese as they journey to nesting grounds further north. The benefits for wildlife are easy to see but wetlands have a far more subtle role. All wetlands, including these drier areas plus the, the very wet marshlands and boggy areas um, that are saturated throughout the year, are really important for uh, 
flood control. Um, they've served quite a useful purpose in certain areas to uh, filter out pollutants. At Fort Boise Wildlife Management Area, there are five ponds standing between the drain water from farmers' fields and the Snake River. And the wetland just acts like a big filter system. The, the silt settles out when the water slows down and the plants use a lot of the excess nutrients. Every wetland improves water quality. At Fort Boise, manager Claire Kofed is reversing the trend of wetlands loss. By next summer, this field, recently purchased by the Fish and Game Commission, will be well on its way to looking like this one nearby, another man-made wetland. We started a wetland in eastern Idaho and we're pumping into a natural basin over there and within hours we had ducks and geese and even some swans on it, so they really respond to that sort of thing. The movie Field of Dreams said, if you build it, they will come, but that takes money. One of the most important contributors to wetland restoration is the hunter. It's amazing how People like myself that enjoy uh, wetlands and waterfowl uh, want to protect these kinds of environments and they see them as a precious resource and once they're lost, uh, they'll never be regained. Each waterfowl hunter must purchase a federal duck stamp. These monies are used to improve wetlands in the United States. In Idaho, Hunters are also required to buy a state duck stamp to finance a fish and game program called HIP, Habitat Improvement Program. The program helps landowners on a cost share basis develop ponds and build nesting islands. Since 1987, when the program was initiated, $1.2 million has been spent acquiring land and improving waterfowl habitat in Idaho. But most of our duck population nests in Canada, where five years of drought have taken a drastic toll on breeding areas. Mallard numbers have dropped from a high of 12 million to 6 million in North America. To fill the gap, a private conservation group made up of waterfowl hunters, Ducks Unlimited, collects almost $68 million annually to improve nesting marshlands. We're striving to build those populations to good, sustainable numbers. The problem, as usual with most wildlife, is the loss of critical habitat. And uh, for waterfowl, that's wetlands. Wetlands, a long neglected part of the puzzle that nurtures our world, a refuge for wildlife, and in some ways, a refuge for man. I like just being here. I like to feel this wind in my face and see birds in the sky. So the wetland environment to me is uh, something I would hate to live without. As autumn moves aside to make room for the winter, Idaho's wildlife begin their own transitions. Grizzly bears and black bears rumble into their own chosen dens for the winter. Sharp-tailed grouse and other upland game birds seek out the high grasses along the riverbanks for protection from blustery winds. But the elk and antelope and deer of Idaho spend the whole summer preparing against the cold and snows of winter. They've browsed the desert and high country, choosing a rich, nutritious diet that will build the fat reserves for the season to come. Soon, they will stand the test. It comes first to the high country, nature gently burying its dead. The brown, withered leaves of fall gradually disappear under a cleansing layer of white. But the season's first delicate, lacy flakes disguise the harsh bite of the Rocky Mountain winter to come. The wildlife knows. Instincts don't change. Deer and elk follow the path of a thousand years, journeying to the more forgiving territory of lower elevations. But some winters, even these don't forgive. Nature steps in, and the weak and the crippled begin to die. Starvation is one of nature's laws, 
but a difficult one for man to accept. The feeding of wildlife is just one of those, one of those things that seems like a simple solution to a problem. Animals are going to starve. Let's feed them. And if we start feeding these animals, we can end up in trouble. We really have to be critical of what we're doing to tip this nature scale. The last large-scale winter feeding program in Idaho was the winter of 88-89. That year, Fish and Game fed about 23,000 animals. That may sound like quite a few, but actually it adds up to less than 6% of Idaho's population of deer, elk, and antelope. Here in Idaho, we like to think this is still a wild state. Well, I'm all for keeping wildlife wild. If we start feeding them on a, uh, on a feedlot in the wintertime, we're concentrating these animals. We're asking for disease problems, very similar to what happened in Wyoming. This is one of 15 feed grounds in Wyoming where elk are being vaccinated for disease. We've got two guns that are attached together. The rifle uh, shoots the, the bio bullet, and the black pistol um, shoots the, uh, the paintball. Got her. It's kind of a two-step process. We mark the animal so that uh, we can later identify that it's been uh, vaccinated. Wyoming got into a pattern of winter feeding in the early 1900s, and it's never stopped. Each winter, the wild elk of Wyoming come to the feed grounds for handouts, and each winter, the concentration of animals spreads disease. We're uh, working on a program to vaccinate our elk, uh, our feed ground elk populations for brucellosis, which is a disease, a cattle disease that, uh, that our feed ground elk populations have that uh, causes cows to abort their calves. Wyoming's domestic cattle have been designated brucellosis free for the last five years. This means that ranchers can ship their livestock anywhere in the United States without having to pay for expensive blood tests. The reason we're involved in this program is uh, primarily because of the concerns of, of uh, transmitting brucellosis to domestic livestock. For a state to be designated as brucellosis free is an expensive process. It's in Wyoming's best interest to preserve this status, but feeding and vaccinating Wyoming's elk population also comes at a price. Vaccinations alone cost the U.S. Department of Agriculture over $100,000 a year. Add to that over $2 million spent on feeding by the state and federal governments, and you have a hefty price tag. We'll be vaccinating as long as we're feeding elk. This is exactly the scenario Idaho is trying to avoid. Since October 1990, Idaho's domestic cattle have been designated brucellosis free. But unlike Wyoming, Idaho's elk are not harboring the disease. At this point in time, we have not found a brucella positive elk in Idaho, but it's waiting to happen. And if we start feeding these animals on a year by year basis, we can end up in trouble by acclimating those animals to come back to that area to be fed. So what is the answer? Rancher Dave Nelson of the Idaho Cattle Association is totally opposed to feeding elk on a year by year basis. He feels that concentrating animals only creates disease problems. According to Fish and Game, one answer is improving wildlife's traditional winter range. Another may be to keep the population numbers down. The hardest thing to do is to back off and let nature take its course uh, because people don't want to see things die. Well, that's, that's pretty, that, that's nice that we have that ability to look at life with these nice rose-colored glasses, but it's not that way in nature. Idaho's wildlife is one of the most precious legacies we can pass on to our children. The challenge seems to be to keep the wildlife wild. For anyone who loves to fish as much as I do, this story is for you. There's no doubt about it. Idaho has a sufficient variety of fishing to suit almost any taste, whether it be a five-year-old bringing home his or her first perch, or even a man who loves to fish so much that he's become Idaho's resident fisheries manager. I like everything about it. On one day, I like coming out and just being here. And if I catch some fish, that's great. Uh, but just being out here on a stream like this, the next week, I may want to go to Cascade and sack up a cooler full of perch and put a put away some perch fillets for the winter. 
the next weekend I may go bass fishing. Uh, I just I just love to fish. Fish and game surveys show that a lot of folks in Idaho feel the same way about fishing as manager Alf and Buren. In the past, Fish and Game has tried to provide all those experiences in the same place. But beginning in January, new trout regulations will manage different sections of a stream for different experiences. For Idaho's anglers, this means less complicated regulations. We'll be concentrating the, our stockings of hatchery fish in certain stream sections and then setting other stream sections aside for wild trout management. Al finally struck. Well, you even got a reasonable one there. Well, I guess not, but come on. Angler Chris Cordy has been fishing for wild trout on the South Fork of the Boise for 17 years. I can't think of anything finer to do than the state of Idaho than to go fishing oh, and miss fish like that. Fly fishing is, involves not only uh, catching fish, but entomology, the insects, hydrology, the flows of the river. So even if you're not catching fish, it's just fun to be able to study the whole interrelationship of the water and the insects to the fish. There we go. That thing hit the water and that fish just hit it, boom. Nothing big but fun. The new regulations will place a bag limit of two fish on wild trout sections, such as the South Fork of the Payette River, enough for a good camp breakfast. The stream sections stocked with hatchery fish will have a six bag limit for anglers who prefer to harvest more fish. So yeah, we're hoping that the regulations will be a little friendlier to use, and, and uh, the whole idea is fishing should be fun, and fishing should be easy. There we go. Woo! Again, not a monster, but a jumper. I tell you, catching fish on dry flies, though, the size isn't what's fun. It's uh, what that take is just where it's all at. Uh, the big ones are in here. Uh, the, the young ones are so numerous, and they're so active, trying to put on some extra reserves going into winter. Uh, these fish in uh, three or four years will be up to uh, 12, 14 inches, and uh, they'll be the ones that uh, continue to get away from Chris. Boom, boo. Pilot error on that one. Trout are smarter than people think. The new fishing regulations on your favorite fishing hole will be out in early January. It promises to be a great year of fishing. We'd like to update you on a couple of stories from previous shows. You'll remember that for the first time in two years, four adult sockeye salmon survived the 950-mile journey from the ocean to return to their spawning grounds near Stanley. They were captured and carefully monitored at Fish and Game's Sawtooth Hatchery. On October 20th, the female began showing signs that she was ready to spawn. The following morning, the eggs were removed by biologists and mixed with sperm from the three males. When a species teeters on the edge of extinction, each egg is precious. Those the female had already deposited in the raceway were carefully gathered up and added to the others. Scientists placed the fertilized eggs in several incubators. Now it's a waiting game. In about a month, biologists will have an idea on the success of the operation. Remember these fellows? These two bighorn lambs were taken by Caesarean section last spring from wild sheep brought in from the wilderness areas. Lambs had been dying of disease at an alarming rate in the back country and biologists needed critical information that couldn't be gathered in the wild. So an operation was launched to capture pregnant ewes and bring them to this research facility. Monitoring the lambs from birth seemed the best way to find the answers. The animals did make it, they're doing fine. Both of them did break with pastorolosis. They both did get with a bad severe pneumonia, high temperature and became uh, almost more bund or near death. And we did at that time take our samples and treat them and they're both alive. So now we've got those samples and we've got miles and miles of the data that we've got to go through and see what kind of pictures come out. The mothers of these two were taken back to Morgan Creek late last summer. Another bighorn ewe delivered her lamb naturally. Tests were taken on these sheep too. Although the lamb had the pasturella organism, it did not become ill. The monitoring phase over, biologists captured the ewe and her lamb and flew them back to their wild home on the Salmon River. 
It was kind of rewarding to watch those animals back in the wild. There's something refreshing about the first snow of the season. Our incredible Idaho landscape takes on a whole new beauty under an undisturbed blanket of white, especially when you slow down and take a closer look. Tonight, we close with a gentle reminder of the winter to come. For more information on wetlands, write Wetlands, Post Office Box 25, Boise, Idaho, 83707. To find out more about habitat improvement programs in your area, call your local Fish and Game office. <laughs>